Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. There are many iconic aliens from the original Star Trek series, but there is one that's penetrated the mainstream and in some ways is sort of like the original Star Trek meme. Yes, I'm talking about that giant bodybuilding green menace called the Gorn. First appearing in the original series episode Arena from 1967, this verdant bruiser tussled with Captain Kirk at the behest of the Metrons and gave a memorable performance that is still lovingly mocked to this day. On this episode of Trek Untold, we're talking with the main man under that rubber suit, Mr. Bobby Clark. Clark was a stunt performer in many Western shows back in the day and appeared for a total of four different times in the original Star Trek series. Aside from the Gorn, Bobby was also a rider from the Return of the Archons, a follower of Val in The Apple, and a lackey of Evil Chekhov in Mirror Mirror. Now, we've had a few stunt performers in the past on this podcast, like Dennis Madalone and Tom Morga, but those two gentlemen worked during the 90s in a very different time as opposed to the era that Bobby was doing stunts. And as you can imagine, the stunt industry has changed quite a bit in that contemporary era, and it's a real interesting part of Hollywood history. So today, it's bumps, bruises, and gourd fighting here on Trek Untold with the one and only Bobby Clark. But before we jump into our interview, I want to ask you, are you following Trek Untold on social media? It's the best way to keep up to date on who's going to be the next guest on Trek Untold and to learn all about the other cool things that are happening here. So if you're on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, go ahead and look up Trek Untold, all one word, and give us a follow and a like. If you'd like to help support the show monetarily, go ahead and check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold to check out some of the merchandise we have available. This includes t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, sweatshirts, stickers, and a whole bunch more. So go ahead and check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold. You can also support our show by visiting patreon.com slash Trek Untold. If you become a paid subscriber to Trek Untold, you'll get first access to the show and a chance to ask our guests questions on future episodes. But most of all, please subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it or watching it. And if you've already done that, please also leave a review and a rating if you can. Leaving ratings and reviews helps increase the visibility of podcasts on platforms like iTunes and other places like it. It shows that you're listening and that you like it, and that other people who are interested in the same subject are going to probably like it too. It helps us grow, it helps us get better guests, and it helps us keep bringing this amazing Trek Untold show to you. If you're already following us or have supported us in any other way, thank you, of course, for being a part of the Trek Untold family. There's a lot of Star Trek podcasts out there, and we're very grateful that you chose us to listen to. I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our friends at Triple Fiction Productions, who make some great 3D printed Star Trek inspired toys and replicas for fans of all ages and toys of all sizes. But you'll hear more about them a little later on in the show. Now, without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold. And now join me on the other side of the screen. We've got a legendary stunt performer here with us. You guys know him best, of course, as the Gorn from Arena. We're going to get to that in a little while. But Bobby, how's it going this morning? It's fine. Thank you, Matt. It's a bright day. Everything is good. And I'm breathing. (laughs) It's always a good day when you're breathing. That's for sure. So where are we going now? Well, let's just jump right on into things here. Uh, now, normally on the show, I'd ask my guests what their earliest memory is of Star Trek, but you were on season one, so we're going to skip that. We're going to go right into some other stuff, and that's uh, my question about your background. So uh, I'd like to hear about where you were born, who your parents were, and what little Bobby Clark wanted to be when he grew up. Well, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, the, my parents, they, they, they were alive for a long time. I don't really know them that well i lived with my mom a while for when i was a baby and stuff and i uh, saw my dad once in a while and i went to military school when i was five so it's it was kind of i had one of those uh, off kind of lives i guess you'd call it and i lived with other people friends of my mom's and then i mom got married to a man from louisiana and then I went and lived with them for a while, and then they figured that I was just a little too much for him. And then I went off to live with my cousins, and I'd, I'd been running around quite a bit. And I just decided when I was a young boy to get my butt out of where I was and start start living instead of gagging around all my time. So I did, and uh, I, I did pretty well. I went up to Susanville and started, that's where I started the cowboy stuff. 
And then I went on to the racetracks for quite a while and so forth and joined the Army National Guards and was in there for a while. <laughs> I just said, I said, Scott, I, I don't like this too well. So I went and I joined the Navy. And about what year was that? Were you doing your service? Uh, I joined the service in 1953, early 53. And I got out in 57. So, and I was aboard the USS Yorktown for all, all of my time in the service. And, uh, had a, I've had a, I've had a good, I've had a good solid life and I've learned a lot. And when I came out, I says, I'm not going to do this cowboy boots and Levi's. I'm going to, I'm going to dress up and wear suits and things. So I bought a suit and stuff and I decided I was going to be a salesman and went to work for the Pontiac agency and starved at that. And, uh, I couldn't sell a nickel for a dime. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that that that's more or less how my life has ran. And then all of a sudden, I started wondering, you know, I got to do something better than this. And I, I I know a lot of cowboys and whatever, and I'd get to talking with them, and they says, well, why don't you go to work for the studios? So that was another era that I went through in life because the studios were pretty tied up and you couldn't get in you couldn't get registered with a casting agency and unless you belong to the guild and you had to be a guild member before you could work for them uh, and it was one of those back and forth uh, catch 22s but finally I did I did get the uh, the greeting to come in and become an extra that's that's where I started my picture life as being an extra. That's a quite a journey because when we're talking about being a cowboy, we're literally talking like you're a ranch hand, right? Well, uh, I've never been a ranch hand, but uh, I rodeoed a while and, you know, weekends when I when they could do it. And I thought maybe that would be a hell of a good thing to do, you know, but uh, I didn't do that well as a rodeo <laughs> cowboy. So I just uh, I just lingered around. I I I wore. I did. I, hey, I wasn't that bad, but I wasn't good enough to continue and make a life of it like they're doing now. And stuff. So now at this point, you are getting your first steps into Hollywood. You're being an extra. Do you remember uh, what the first show or what the first film was that you worked on? Oh, you know, the first the first episode I worked on was called Rawhide. Ah, oh, Rawhide with Clint Eastwood. Yeah, that was that was my first extra experience as a as an extra. And I did a few few of those. And then I got picked to do a couple others, and I, I've done I've done many. Uh, well, I've done practically at a time or two on just about every Western uh, TV program there was, and I wound up on on Rawhide. I mean, pardon me, not Rawhide. I wound up on uh, Gunsmoke, and they they kind of took me under their arm, and I did uh, eight years on Gunsmoke. Now, was those eight years as an extra or was that as a stunt performer? Uh, no, I, I started off as an extra for the first time. And then uh, a little while after that, then I, I decided, why am I why am I doing this for this when I could be doing that and take a handful home? <laughs> so that, that's that's how that that's how that worked out. And then I I started uh, training myself to to do stunt work and met up with some guys that uh, that could do it. But now these are other old cowboys uh, like uh, Gary Gatlin, Jerry Gatlin and uh, uh, Chuck Hayward. And, and in those days that, that those were, you know, and uh, Chuck Roberson, those were the, 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 the cowboy, the head cowboy stunt men in the business then. And uh, yes, I, I worked with many more and the names are hard to remember and because uh, it's it's been a while since i worked with them now i've been uh, more or less retired since uh 2000 i guess you call it or whatever i happened to fall into this convention stuff with the with the star trek because i got on to star trek and did four episodes and, and i'm still doing conventions <laughs> which is great and hopefully one day i'll get to actually meet you at one of these conventions in person 
Uh, but yeah, I want to actually just follow up with you about uh, when you're training to become an Alice Trump performer. So this is back in the era where we're still talking black and white TV and color TV is still kind of a new thing even. Uh, so in this era, where do you get training? You mentioned a few names, but where do you get training and what is the training like to do stunts in that era? Well, in, in those days, uh, you didn't get trained. You You more or less got informed how to do things and you watched what you what they were doing on the set and you, you see it and then you take it home and you do it yourself and uh fights i learned fights from uh another stunt guy his name was royden clark god bless him he's passed away now and and his brother who who could have been a a, a, a gracious movie fan is uh, and I'm trying to think of his brother's name and I can't quite think of that, but, uh, just, just different people. Uh, as far as how did I learn to do things? Uh, uh, for instance, uh, high fall, I started doing that off of the top of my garage into, uh, we had K-pop pads then. And if you didn't have K-pop bags, you used boxes and situations like that. And, uh, I went from the garage to the house roof and, you know, and, and it's a whole different, different deal when you're up there, the pad looks a little bit smaller, but it's still, when you're only like, uh, oh, what, 15 feet in the air, the bag still looks pretty big and whatever. And I'd do some falls off of the roof and had to figure out why I'm banging my feet on the ground and missing my pads and stuff like that and I keep moving my pad up a little bit and up and up and finally I figured out well by god that pad's got to be out of ways when I come off here because I'm going to go out and uh, that was how I learned how to do high falls and uh, saddle falls you just uh, you just you just get on a horse and just about anybody can do a saddle fall and uh you learn how to you learn how to hit the ground and take the rolls and then do stuff like that so that's how you learn to to do a saddle fall and then there's training your horse to do a horse fall and this is all stuff that that you, you don't go to a class or anything like this there's there was a, a class that I went to uh, a couple of times and the gentleman's name was Bob Yerkes. And he was, I was, I, I would imagine that he was the king at that time of, of the high falls because he chained actors, how to do shows in, in the circus. And he did a lot of trapeze work and uh, the fellow named Chuck Couch, he was a stunt man too. And he did, See, they they did they got into that, and I stuck with the horses more than than I did uh, anything else. And fights, uh, we did we didn't have anybody give us an instruction on how to punch and stuff like that. We didn't go to classes; they they didn't have it. Later on, they started having classes and stuff like that. Well, I I, I figured uh, that I was too good for to go to have a class. But, you know, you're never too good to learn. So that, that was that was the old rough way that 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 I had learned more or less how to do things. And the same thing went with car work and and motorcycle work. I, I've ridden, fortunately, I, I've ridden motorcycles a lot in my life, and uh, I was pretty handy to do motorcycles, and I did several of those movies. So it, it, it all works out and it all works out. I did the horror pictures. So anyway, that, that's how I got into the stunt work and stuff like that. So Bobby, I got a few other folks I wanted to talk about. I wanted to try and jog your memory here today. Uh, and one of those folks is Hal Needham. Uh, that's the guy who Brad Pitt's character was based off of in Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Very legendary stunt performer. Uh, and you worked with him in 1967 on Hell's Angels on Wheels, which we're talking motorcycles. There you go. Uh, what do you remember about working with Hal? Hal was a was a, was a hell of a stunt man, and he turned out to be a heck of a, a director, and stuff like that. I worked with him on 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 western shows before Hal became Hal Needham. He was he was a he was a cowboy too, and he wrecked wagons and 
which which we all did at some time or other, and uh, did a lot of high falls and 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 walk into things. Now that's when he was that was when he was a cowboy. And I I never worked with him when uh, on his features that he did as a stunt coordinator and director, but uh, yeah, Hal, I I remember Hal and. Oh, good gosh. If you if you put the name up, I probably know him. I'm also curious if you ever had a chance to work with uh, Charlie Paterni. He's another legend in the industry in that time. I worked with Charlie Paterni, and I worked with his son also. His son, his son was becoming a stuntman. And, uh, yes, I worked with Charlie on a uh, show called, uh, you know, I, I can't even think of the name of that show. I got I got a list of shows here that I've done. And, uh it will come to me. I, I'm not remembering things too much anymore, Matt. Just uh, I'm get. I guess I'm getting a little bit shy here once in a while. He did a lot of running in and stuff like that, and and jumping off of balconies and uh, with with Charlie Paterni. Uh, he was the director of the the shows, stuff like that. And I worked with Bobby Blake, and I worked with. Uh, hundred people. I always was just work. I went to work. When I was done, I came home. I didn't linger around. I didn't mix with all the people and stuff like that. When I started working, I have a family and uh, rent a little ranch out here in New Hong. Uh, th this is how I am. I just, uh, I'm not a big star goer and uh, I never, uh, I never walked around and met a lot of these people that that ran these shows i met them when they came to the set and i had a hello how are you i'm you and i'm you know stuff like that but i never i never went and talked to anybody that 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 was like that i did a lot of independence independent movies and and that's where i did the horror shows and stuff like that and it just turns out it's it's something I did. Darn it, I forget a lot of things. And it kicks me it off a little bit when I get, yeah, when I, when I get on this thing here. Well, let me help you out with one other name here I've got for you, and that's uh, Gene LaBelle. And that's someone who I always ask questions about. Gene LaBelle, one of my favorite guys in grappling and martial arts. And he did a lot of stunt work back in the 50s, 60s, and even to today, practically. Uh, and you worked with him a few times also, right? Oh, yeah. I've, I've, I worked with Gene a lot of times. And uh, rode motorcycles with him, and yeah, yeah, he's 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 a kickback stuntman too. He he didn't he didn't talk a whole lot. And yes, I know him, and uh, and I know his brother Louis Elias, and 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 I knew this is this was when when I was working, and that was that was a long time ago. It seems it's a long time ago. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I did a show called No Time for Sergeants, Matt Houston, Mod Squad, uh, Beretta, Emergencies, and uh, Code Red. I, I was a stunt coordinator on Code Red for a while, and I stunt, uh, was a coordinator on a lot of uh, uh, the offbeat Western shows, and oh, just, just did a lot of that, and uh, that's how I made my, that's how I made who I am, but when I got to go on Star Trek, that that kind of changed things because it seems there's a lot of people out there that like the Gorn. And oh, yeah. Yeah. That was that was an easy that was an easy show. I wasn't seen. I, they didn't hear my voice and they couldn't figure <laughs> me out. So easy I could walk through a crowd. <laughs> no one didn't know who I was. <laughs> So before we jump into Star Trek, I've got one other sci-fi question here for you. And I know that you were also in 2001 A Space Odyssey, but I, I understand that you weren't actually in the movie. You were there for some other work beforehand. Is that correct? I did uh, do some preparation work for uh, 2001, as a matter of fact. Yes, yes. But I didn't work on the show. I did some preparation on the uh, when they were floating in space. So I was all harnessed up. We were in a barn in Hollywood somewhere. And uh, they hooked me up and I, I had to like float in the air and move slow and, and do this. And they'd pull me along for to go to another part of the show. Yeah, I did that for about two days. And 
and then that was the end of that. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props, or a toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or a part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triple fiction productions. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hi, I'm Jonathan Frakes. If you're of a certain age, you may remember me as Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. And my wonderful brother Daniel died with pancreatic cancer 24 years ago. They opened him up, they diagnosed, they said, you've got six months to live, and that was it. He died four months later. And at that time, there was a 3% survival rate. Since then, we've grown to the embarrassingly high number of 10%. But a dear friend of mine, and probably all of yours, Kitty Swink, is one of those 10%. She has survived pancreatic cancer for 17 going on 18 years. Pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, with a five-year survival rate. That's just 10%. And more than 60,000 Americans are estimated to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2021. More than 48,000 will die from the disease. Because symptoms are often vague, can be hard to detect, That's why I'm supporting the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, the leading patient advocacy organization committed to fighting the world's toughest cancer. PanCan is working hard to create outcomes for this devastating disease through its groundbreaking research in early detection and better treatment options. PanCan drives progress by funding life-saving research, providing personalized patient services and creating a community of supporters and volunteers like you who will stop at nothing to create a world in which all pancreatic cancer patients will thrive. You can help support our important mission by donating today at pancan.org. Thanks for your time. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so Bobby, let's go ahead and beam into our Star Trek discussion now because you were in several episodes of Star Trek, but I think the one everybody knows the most is Arena. That's the infamous episode where you are one of the actors who was the Gorn. Uh, so let's just start here yes, with uh, how you got cast into the show here. So uh, if, if I remember correctly, you were uh, friends with Joseph Penby, right? Yes, and he 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 called, he called me after we did a show, and he says, I might have another job for you, Bobby. And I says, oh, great. And he says, yeah. Yeah, I think you'll like that job if I if I you know if I go any further with it. And I said, well, you know, let me know and everything. Later on, he calls me up and he says, I got a I I got the show for you and it's you'll really like it. It's a good show. He says, and I want you to go to uh, Universal and and get the uh, well Paramount. I mean, he says, uh, Desi Lou is where I worked for it. And he said, I want you to go there and uh, get into the get into a wardrobe 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 man will show you where to go so i says well all right i'll go there we'll do that so i went to wardrobe walked in the room looked around and I, I, there's no wardrobe in here i'm used to seeing you know wardrobe hung up on a hanger and stuff like this and there, there's no wardrobe in here and the wardrobe guy said there is your wardrobe's in there on the rack i looked on the rack and i said no there's just some some things you guys left on the 
on the rack draped over it. And he says, I'll be there in a minute. So he came in there and he took that stuff that was draped off over there and it was the costume for the for the Gorn. And it was it was made out of uh, a diver's uh, diver man's wetsuit and the neoprene, the quarter inch neoprene. And then they put the other muscles on it and stuff like that. So I didn't I didn't even know. Wow. What is this? I said, and he. He says, well, that's your wardrobe. And I, all right. So I put it on and everything and it fit good and everything, everything was fine. And later on, he, we got a date to go to Vasquez Rocks and uh, wear the, wear the suit and do the Gorn. So that's, that's, that's where the Gorn was filmed in a place called Vasquez Rocks in Agua Dulce, California. Now, had you actually watched any Star Trek on TV yet? I don't know if any episodes had aired yet, but do you recall if the show had been on and if you were familiar with it, or was this at a time when it was still very much brand new? It might have just came on, because I, I did mine in uh, November of uh, 56. It's 66. All right, I did that one, and it came out in, uh, in 67 is when it, when it came on. So I'm thinking maybe I didn't see any because I, I was I'm I'm still not really a Trekkie, but I I I do I do like watching it and uh, it it could be and I I've got trinkets from when I was on it and and I buy once in a while a, a trinket to remind me of it. So as we mentioned, this episode was filmed outside. It was filmed in Vasquez Rocks, and it's known to be a very hot, very dry kind of area. What was it like wearing that giant suit with the sun beating down on you? You know, it was uh, it, it was in November. November in, out here can be reasonable. It, it was it was all right if you didn't have to wear the suit. But the suit was was quite hot, and uh, I had to walk slow and had big feet, and it was hard to it was hard to get around and all that brush that was there and. Uh, I'd take a cup and once in a while a uh, one foot. I think I think the I think the feet were about 17 inches long. So it, it was hard to thump around in the brush, especially if you're trying to follow a little pail. Pat pat. So yeah, the, the, the hoof foot would get in it and I'd fall down and get up again and you know it was a cut and go. But uh, later on the next day, then the, the, everything kind of went a little easier because I was out of the brush more and I was just kind of walking after after Bill. One that people always ask, that that's a question they always ask. It must have been hot in that suit. Well, it was hot in the suit. And uh, between takes, I would I had a ladder type of a perch that, that they put me on, that I climbed up on. And then the wardrobe man on top of the rock there would come and he'd take the head off of me and We'd open me up in the here and, and let me breathe a little bit. And it wasn't that cumbersome, but yeah, it was it was it was kind of kind of warm. And I did get breaks every time, you know, we got a cut and they were changing things and they would go to Bill. Well, that was that was my rest period. They asked a lot about the makeup I had. Well, what you saw there, the makeup was just around here because when I opened my mouth to talk then they wouldn't see no face in there. Well, my question for you with that helmet on is how much could you see and how much could you hear? Uh, hearing wasn't too bad, but the, the sight, yes, it was, uh, the, the, the eyes were, were sequences, but just under the eyes, there was a couple of slits. Now, I could look through the eyes and everything was psychedelic, but I looked through the slits and I could see I would say maybe five to 10 feet in front of me. Well, that's, that, that's about four or five steps. And uh, I'm just hoping that if I see a, something here, well, I better walk there. So I miss that day. <laughs> Otherwise I'll be on my butt again. It, it was, it was cumbersome. It was, it was hard to walk in and, uh, it was a hell of a it was a hell of an experience, I'll tell you.
I and nowadays I don't know what I'd do if they because they call you in two hours ahead of work every day and they sit you down and they're putting this stuff all over your face and glue and all. I don't know if I'd go for that today. So we should add that you were not the only person wearing the Gorn suit during this shoot. It was also uh, Gary Combs. He was wearing the full suit. And William Blackburn as well. He was doing it for the uh, tight shots of the head. And had you worked with those gentlemen before? Well, I I know I know Gary Combs very well. He's a cowboy. And he, he did a lot of work on horseback, too. And they used to have a, a rental thing down in Long in Los Angeles at the, I don't know, we we. we when I forget, even forgot what we called it then because it was a good, it was a place there to all go by Pickwick and stuff it's down there on, on in the, by Griffith Park. Uh, but uh, now Gary was on the show and I he, he he was used they used him for some walking and stuff. So how do we tell the difference of when it's Bobby Clark on screen and when it's Gary on screen? Uh, really, it's it I, it would be it would be hard to do because uh, well. He wasn't on a whole lot. He 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 did come on, and it, like yeah, it wouldn't be hard to tell the difference, I guess. I I know Bill Blackburn, but I don't remember him uh, doing anything as a Gorn. He could have, but uh, and uh, Gary Combs, and there was another one you, you said. Well, we should also mention there was Dick Dial. He was William Shatner's stunt double. Dick in that episode. Dial. He do, yes, Dick Dial was on there. He doubled. Uh, uh, bill on the fight had you worked with dick previously as well yes i have but i never never knew him uh i worked i worked with many 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 stuntmen but i just you know i know who they are and when i see them on the set and talk hi how you doing what's up so forth and so on and and you know they're cowboys too a lot of them hang out at the the cafes outside the studios and stuff i that, that wasn't my that wasn't my thing. I, my thing was come home and do what I had to do here. So we talked about the costume and how hard it was to move around in that. But when it comes time to do the fight scenes, it's like one of the biggest uh, jokes that people talk about in Star Trek is how the Gorn moves so slow. So how much oh, of that, that was that the was, costume? Yeah. How much of that was you or the director saying move slow? The, the director said move slow. He says you're you're a reptilian, you're a lizard, and uh, lizards move slow. And uh, he says just just move slow. You 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 you're taking positive steps. You're not just walking and stuff like that. You know where you're walking, and you you know you aren't really moving your arms up and down. You just you just this this was it here. It was hard to sit. You couldn't sit down in the in the costume. Uh, it was uh, hard to go and relieve yourself in the in the costume because you got to unzip all of this stuff up. And oh boy, that was a whole problem. I can remember the before we even started shooting. They said, "How much coffee did you have this morning?" <laughs> and they found out. So anyhow, that was that was that part of the suit, and uh, uh, they did some commercials with with the Gorn Bill did, and uh, I don't even know who that was. So <laughs> yeah, that was much later I on. Never, yeah, I, yeah, I don't I don't inquire. I never, I never went and like I said, I never went down and visited these people. I went I went down once to say hi and whatever like this, but then I never says, you know, can you use me on a show? Can I do this and can I do that? I want to work on your show. I, I never, I never said that. I just went to work and came home. So let's talk a little bit more about William Shatner because you get to spend pretty much most of your scenes, pretty much all of your scenes are with William Shatner. Uh, so how was he at picking up the choreography and what was he like to work with? Well, I worked, I worked with Bill before he did Star Trek too, and. Uh, I've known him, and he and, and when he was doing Star Trek, he's he's he was he's a pretty good guy, and he he did his lines well. He knew how to do his do his stuff, and as it went on, uh, yeah, you could see some change in him and stuff. That means that he's you know he's just getting older, and he's getting more used to the being the gym, and uh, <laughs> that and that was it. He but I've I always got along well with with Bill, and uh, 
I, you know, uh, we did a, uh, oh, he was a cop on it. TJ uh, Hooker? I got for TJ Hooker. And uh, there, there's other shows, but I think I've, I think I've done more with uh, personally with him. And, um, and the last, uh, last couple of years, I've, it's gotten to be where we're more friendship because I, I never talked to these people, you know, uh, if I saw him, I'd, I'd say, hi, Jim. And he'd say, yeah, hi back. And I'd go back and I'd sit in my booth and he'd go there and he'd do his stage thing. And, and then I'd get done and I'd do my little stage thing on the show and, uh, everything, uh, that, that's, that's how it worked. I, I was never a, an actor chaser or, uh, and stuff like that. When I first started out, yeah, I, I thought that I had to go. I was kind of told I'd be a good leading man. So that was BS anyway. But uh, anyway, anyhow, I, I went to Universal and I used to go to the casting offices. Uh, uh, an agent took me to the casting offices. And, you know, and we, we, we got a few things. I was with another, I was with, I've only been with two agents in my whole life. And uh, one of them was a pretty good guy. His name was Bob Brandes. And then the other one was uh, was a good old man. He, but And uh, I more or less just took him to the studios to see all of the, act, uh, the casting people that he used to see. And just to follow up with you a little bit more about working with Shatner on this episode, uh, when you guys are doing this fight scene, are there any moments where he's like really laying into you because you're wearing that really thick suit, or is he working very safe? Well, no, no. He, Bill, Bill was an actor, and uh, he, you know, he did this, and then I did this, and popped his ears and things. He's he's done that on. That's 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 the Bill, the that's the Bill, the Bill Shatner. There's about four or five things that he did. A, a drop kick he used to try and do. I mean, he did. He'd hit through a drop kick and kick you back. Well, he, yeah, you'd feel that to go back. And but that that's what we were there for. We, we were prepared to, we, you know, we padded up for stuff like that. Well, when I was a Gorn, I I didn't have, have to have any pads. My whole my whole body was a pad. But uh, yeah, he he. But uh, you know, just flipped him and. Because it was done in cuts anyway, so that's that. That's how that's how that all went. How many of the scenes that you did were with William Shatner, and how many of the scenes are with Dick Dial as his double? I, I don't know. I think uh, I think when when Shat went went over uh, over Dick Dial and uh, went down, I think that was I think that was about the last of the fight was was when that when that happened. So it's mostly Shatner doing his own stunts in this episode, then. Yes, yeah. Shat Shatner was Shatner's a very handy, handy, handy guy, and he knows he's not going to do anything that's really hairy and dangerous. And that that fight was definitely not hairy or dangerous. As a matter of fact, I believe I read somewhere that uh, that was the worst fight on television. And there's definitely been some better ones, but it's, I think probably the most iconic fight of all time is between you and Captain Kirk. That's for sure. Well, there there's a few where we got close and hugged and <laughs> stuff like this and, and, and whatever. Yeah, that, that's that's pretty good. I have another picture of myself and Bill, but I don't don't have it here where we're we're discussing the fight. So yeah, that that that's about it uh, as far as the uh, about as far as the Gorn went with the with the fight. Now, when this episode first aired on TV, did you actually watch it? Oh uh, well, I've seen it, yeah, but I don't actually stay there and and watch the episode. I've seen it probably maybe three times, and that's that's enough. So, what did you think of your performance looking back on it now? If you were going to grade yourself today from what you did in the nineteen sixties, uh, did you like what you did? Do I like what I did? Yeah, I I say it was all right. Um, you know, it's hard to, to think how I thought I was. I I don't really like to see myself on on TV or something. I but I will look and and see. Uh, it's like uh, you know, if I roll a car or something, and I see that on television. Well, do I like the way I rolled that car? Well, it's it's over and done. Yeah, I better like it.
So uh, I think I did pretty fair on on the, as the Gorn, but the people tell me I did super great, and I'm not going to argue with them. So let me ask you this, Bobby. If you could change anything about the stunts or any of the action that happened in that episode, would you do anything differently? Would you add something? Would you take something away? How would you approach it if you had your ideal setting? Oh, boy. Well, it would. It, it's kind of hard to figure that because, you know, the Gorn had all the... All the uh, the Gorn had all the, uh, what, what do you call it? He, he had all the, the stuff to to kill anybody. So you really can't do a heck of a lot with it. Uh, I mean, there, there's scenes there where you, you look at it and say, well, Christ, look at him right there. He could have bit half of his head off for crying out loud, but he didn't, you know, and it's, it's, it, it it was just a, a funny thing, I guess you'd call it. Uh, I I think I did fair. I I because it wasn't a big. There was no real. I never did a real stunt in that in that picture. You know, it's it was just the uh, walk around and and then uh, hit hit the, uh, the the trap and fall down and stuff like that uh, yeah it, it was it was all right uh gary's the one that was uh gonna kill him so i i was i was stand, i was by on that whatever but uh everything and everybody there was great all right so let's move on to some of your other star trek appearances because there are three other episodes that you worked on uh one of those is yes. in mirror mirror and that's a very very another well-known episode uh, and we actually interviewed Garth Pillsbury. I think he might have actually been in that same scene you're in, because you're one of the guards during that little fight scene in the hallway between Kirk uh, and some of those people attacking him from Chekhov. So, do you remember uh, anything about yeah, that, Jay? Do you remember? Do you actually? I should ask. Do you remember Garth Pillsbury at all? Well, see, I don't know the name. Now, there there is a, a gentleman I did meet. Uh, well, uh, first off, I'll tell you, we came up. We when well, they opened the door, we were supposed to just come up through the elevator, and we step out, and I was one of the guards that was holding, holding, and, and Bill. And I don't quite remember, but somehow or other, we got in a scuffle, we got in a fight, and I went down. I got shot when I was getting up. Now, I'll tell you a funny thing about that. It was probably, well, it was only a, a, a maybe two years ago that the guy who shot me came up to him and we talked because I didn't remember him from the scene. I don't remember some of these other other actors that I worked with, but he come up to me and he says, you see that there where you got shot? He says, yeah, he says, I'm the one that shot you. And that that was that was really great because we 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 talked back together back and forth on it. And I was selling I was signing autographs for as as who as Bobby Clark and he was signing autographs of him and people who put put them together and the straight shot it was, it was really that that was a quite a moment right there to meet somebody like that to come up you know and he, he introduced himself again and then it was it was just great you know and that was about it for that and and a lot of other guys uh, of course i i worked with a lot of a lot of guys that i knew and the guy that shot me, I don't believe he was a stunt man. He was just he was an actor, and that's that's all he did was yep. phased me to death. Yep, that was Garth Pillsbury. Uh, in fact, we interviewed him months ago on this show. Uh, so yeah, it's funny you guys just together same thing. <laughs> you guys were both together at the same convention yeah. at the same time. Oh yeah, we we did. Did he talk about it? Oh yeah, we talked all about that scene. So now I got your story and I got his story. <laughs> Does it match? They match up nicely. <laughs> oh yeah, they bookend each other. <laughs> Well, I got another one for you too, Bobby, because uh, I know you were also in the episode Return of the Archons, and in that episode yes, you I worked was. with Carl Held. So in that episode, it's Captain Kirk, it's Bones, it's Spock. Uh, I think Sulu is there, and also among those guys is Carl Held. And so uh, you were one of the townspeople, I believe, in Return of the Archons, correct? Yes, I was. So there's a scene where uh, basically all the townspeople go crazy and they're throwing things and they're throwing rocks and stuff. And at one point, uh, Carl Held he gets hit in the head with a rock. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering if you remember working on that day, if and maybe that was you who actually threw that rock at him, perhaps. Let's find out. But, uh, yeah, tell us about what you did on Return of the Archons. Uh, Return of the Archons, 
Joe Pevney, I was I was a, an actor stuntman on that. So uh, yes, pardon me. Uh, that that was that was a great great moment uh, in my life for Star Trek. See, I I don't rec recognize the 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 name and put a face with it because uh, I probably didn't work with him other than on that show. So my job, of course, as you, as you probably seen. I come in and I bust through the, the store window. And then I come around, and I throw a chair out of the other window and I jump out and I run at the camera and holler with festival, festival. And then I drop down and then I run along down the street and fiddle paddle with a few other actors or stunt people or whatever they were. And that was the end of the, that was the, that was the end of that show. So on that episode of Return of the Archons, it's also known for being filmed on a very famous set. Uh, that was a set that was used for Gone with the Wind and a lot of Westerns. Uh, had you worked on it before or did you know that it was such a famous set? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I just I just did did the job. I, I went to the stage and then and, and, and that's that's about yeah, like I said, I'm I, I'm not a I didn't wander around and look at stuff. I went and sat down. I always sat with with the other stunt men and we played cards and stuff like this and and that was great and then we go to work but uh, like I say I was never a, a, a go I wasn't a go getter I, I kind of was a cut back and if they wanted me fine if they didn't well I'd work here or, or I'd work somewhere else I had a lot of places where you know a lot of time to work I'd uh, I'd work and then it'd be sometimes three, four days before I get another call or something. And uh, I'm not sitting waiting for that call. I'm out doing some work for somebody. Either I'm doing carpenter work or trimming a tree or, or helping with some horses or any, anything I'm doing. I, ju I just did it. That was my, that was it. I didn't live and die to be a, uh, the pictures. I never got, I never got noticed. Well, yeah, we should actually mention that, too, because uh, in this time period as well, stunt performers, they're not really being credited at all in the show. In fact, there's so many uh, shows that are not listed on your IMDb page. Uh, so why weren't stunt performers actually credited back then? Uh, we never got credits. Uh, you know, the, and we uh, there were very few stunt coordinators toward toward the end. Let's see about. Uh, Oh, maybe in the later 70s, I think they started having stunt coordinators or, or whatever. I don't really remember when, but that's when uh, uh, Royden Clark became a stunt coordinator. Uh, Bill, Bill Catching, I, no, I don't know if Bill was a stunt coordinator, but I worked with him on a few shows. Their names weren't at the end of the TV shows. Was that just because you guys were just like day workers and not really considered important? Well, the only thing we were important for is to go out and get ourselves get, get beat up or or get shot or something. That's about what we did. A lot of times we got a we got the, a part that had some dialogue in, and uh, I I did I did several of those shows where I had a little dialogue in them, and uh, uh, it, it's just. I don't I don't know how to how to say it. the the extras that, that worked on these shows they worked hard too they they worked hard and I can remember when when I worked extra I think it was a box lunch and fifteen dollars a day or maybe no twenty five twenty five twenty well it twenty five was the last one it was I started it was twenty five forty something when I started and a box lunch a day so you know the, and 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 a lot of a lot of a lot of guys grew right from that also a lot of guys stuck in there and hung in there and worked their way until finally one day they decided well there weren't going to be any more i noticed extras i noticed that and uh but i still know some of them i, I don't know you know we don't we don't ever get together hmm. it's just and, and a lot of guys that i worked extra with or were stunt men too, you know. That's that's uh, how it went. But that was in the that was in the uh, in in the cowboy field, in the western situation. 
So last but not least, Bobby, we have one other Star Trek episode to talk about, and that's the episode The Apple. And you're one of the worshippers yes. of Val. Uh, so it, I think the French, that's the main thing I remember from the episode is just the very orange, very, very tan looking human aliens. Uh, so what did you do in that episode? Nice, nice colored hair, too, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> My role on the on the Apple was to kill Captain Kirk. And uh, I was I was dressed like that. And oh, help me, Val. Uh, I came out from around the stone and there was three of us came out from around the set there and came and I attacked Shatner. And he, he did his thing. He put that down like that. And I went over him and I got up and we scuffled. And then they went to another scuffle and scuffle. And uh, the guy named Vince Dedrick worked on that. And that that's another guy. You probably heard the name of Vince Dedrick, haven't you? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, we're actually going to probably talk about him in a few moments because I know he was the uh, his son was the stunt coordinator on uh, Star Trek Enterprise. Well, yes. And as I talked to his I talked to Vince just the other day, too. And uh, he's doing fine. He's still working. Wow. That's, that's surprising. But uh, he, he's doing some directing, too, now. And. I've, uh, yeah, I've known Vinny, uh, the boy, for, for a long time. I used to work a lot for a guy named Everett Creech. Did you ever hear of that man? I don't know, know too much about Everett, no. Well, Everett was, was, a, was, a, was a, a quiet soul person, too. But uh, all, a lot of the stunt guys kind of didn't care for him, so to speak. And uh, he, gave, he, he worked a person like myself. He worked a lot. I, I worked a lot for Everett here and there and so, stuff like that. And he was he, he coordinated those shows for me, for us. And uh, I he, he had to go away for a while and took over the as a stunt coordinator on a show called Code Red. And that's that's where I met little Vinny. <laughs> he was he came in to work on the show. And I was a stunt coordinator, and he was he was a young stunt man, and got him into the fire stuff and and whatever. And that's where I met him. I I worked with his dad Vince, oh many times, many times. He rode motorcycles, and he doubled uh, other actors. I doubled some high named actors. Uh, yeah, yeah, he did. So that's it for the official appearances in the original series, but it would be a few decades later that you did return to the set of a Star Trek show, as we just alluded to, uh, and that was on Star Trek Enterprise, and I, I believe you were invited to come check out the set, right? Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the director, I can't remember his name, naturally, and Vince, Benny, Benny direct brought me up there, too, and that it was the first time I had been on a set in several years, and I walked in there and it, you know how everything is the whole picture business has changed it's uh you know they used to have cameras out there and they used to have lights and all this stuff and everyone was working well now they just got a little dinky thing that they the camera out there and the thing goes into another room and the director is sitting back there and so i, I yeah i sat there and i watched the uh, a couple of the scenes where they where their Gorn was there, uh, their their Gorn was a lot different than the one I was. Yeah, their Gorn could actually rip your head off, I and mean, we we're talking about that earlier. Like this is a Gorn that was really <laughs> yeah, vicious. Yeah, I believe that episode was a mirror, mirror darkly, and that was the uh, part of season four of Enterprise, the last season. Um, but did you get a chance to hang out or meet yeah. with Scott Bakula or any other people that were on that episode that day? No, no, I I, I just I just went there. I sat in the chair and. I'd know who the director was if I heard his name, but I can't, I can't remember it. Uh, no, I, I just went there and did my thing. And, you know, I talked to a couple of people, but uh, that was that was about it. They said, how do you do? And they said, how did you like to be in the Gorn and stuff like that? And, uh, you know, just 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 little, little talk, small talk. It wasn't about the business or anything. I never. I never talked much about the business when I when I was in it. It was just what I'm doing, what I'm going to do, and what I've done, and uh, who who am I supposed to meet? Something like that, and whoever that was, I'd probably forget it in a couple of days. 
if I was lucky. I, I mean, if I wasn't lucky, I'd probably forget it in a couple hours. Now, I also know very recently you did make a comeback as the Gorn, and that was in the film Unbelievable by the Fawcett's. And uh, we actually interviewed the uh, Fawcett's a while back. And I got to tell you, Bobby, like when that joke happened, when Don Gornelius shows up on screen, that was like the funniest moment in the entire film for me. So what was it like being the Gorn one more time and being Don Gornelius of all people? Well, you see, I was Don Gornelius, but I was in civilian clothes. I wasn't in, in the Gorn outfit. And uh, I, yeah, I thought that was I thought that was that was quite a thing. We filmed that out of Vasquez Rocks also, and uh, oh, I forget the director's wife the director's wife's name, uh, Angelique. Now she he, she was my daughter Gorn, or yeah, she was my daughter Gorn. And uh, the scene that that I had with her, it was it was funny. I was I'm sitting in a in a regular chair, and I'm just sitting there reading a paper, and they were shooting a, a scene with with her and doing that. And then and and then I remember, she come up and she says, "How was that, Daddy?" and whatever. And I looked up at her and I says, "You're supposed to throw the." stone or throw the rock and then growl. No, I said you're supposed to growl and then throw the rock. And that, that was that was about the end of it. That was that was my little cameo on, on that show. It was a great it was it was kind of a funny show and I've I seen it a couple of times and I still I still hear from uh what did you say her name was again? <laughs> it was Angelique. Huh? Angelique Fawcett. Angelique. Angelique, yes, I I still communicate with her periodically. She's a wonderful woman. Her husband was nice. I met them. I was doing a show in uh, in Anaheim, I think, at the Anaheim Auto Convention Center, and her husband come up and introduced himself to me, and we went out and had lunch. And he says, "I'd like to use you on this show," and so forth and so on. And I says, "Well, well, thank you very much," you know. I would I will be available when you when the time comes and the time came and I was available and I went to work. And so you've been very embraced by the Star Trek fandom and the Star Trek community and you go to all these conventions now. Uh, so how did you start getting into these conventions and uh, why do you love them so much? Well, uh, number one, like I told you, I'm not a I'm not a Trekkie, and I I I was doing Star Trek. When my old my oldest son came up and he says, "Dad, why don't you do a convention?" And I told him, "I don't want to do a convention. What do I need to? What do I have to do a convention for? You know, I'm 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 doing things here and stuff. And so, but I was I was doing I wasn't doing conventions. As a matter of fact, I never did. And he come up to me one time with a little action figure." of the Gorn like this here. And I says, where did you get this? You know? And he says, they're, they're, they're for sale all over. People are buying them. They, 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 they want to see who the Gorn is and whatever. I know, no. And a few days later, he, he come up and says, you know, why don't you do this? He gave me the, the, the thing. And I still said, no, and, but it happened to have been on a weekend and we have a swap meet here in town. So I went to the swap meet and there was somebody there and I don't know his, I can't remember his name either, but he had a table and he had a whole bunch of stuff for sale. And there was one of the Gorn creatures on his, on his, on his table. And I picked this up and I said, where did this come from? And he, he, he told me somewhere he's the, somebody who makes them and manufactures them. And I said, I said, that's kind of funny because I, I did this, this, this was, this was me. And th I, I, this guy liked to fall down and ruin the whole thing. And he said, you're the Gorn. And I, I says, yeah. And he, he says, well, you really are. And I, I mean, yeah, yeah. He said, well, why don't you do some conventions and stuff? And oh, well, you know, and then I left. Then my son hit me again and I says, you know what? Go ahead and set it up for me to do this. And that's this was the 
a creation show and it was called uh, creation it, it was their their one of their main creation shows and it was in Pasadena so uh, that was my first show and he called up me and he says all right you have to get some pictures and and then come to the convention so I I had some pictures here that that the the cameraman took of me and stuff like that and I went to the I went and I had 50 of each of them made so I went to the convention I sat there and put them on a table and good god it wasn't it wasn't by the end of the show I was standing with no pictures I signed every one of them and uh, in about in about two hours and and they were all gone and I said holy good god what is this you know so I got I got another offer to do another show with creation in a few places so now I was now I said well okay now I went and I had different pictures that I had and they were some of them were color, some were black and white, but I had those on my table and I I was signing pictures and it was the the the, the money was coming in and I, that was kind of nice, you know. Pays for my golf. I I just I started doing that and then I, I said, well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll keep doing it. so I I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And then another show would come up from somebody else and they'd call me over and I'd go do that and although I'm not a Trekkie I'll tell you I really have a, 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 a piece of my heart that those fans can can have because they're 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 really they're, they're, I don't know they're fantastic and and they're 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 so truthful and whatever like this and I, I still to this day I can't believe how they go out and these guys work 40 hours a week and they save money and stuff like that. And they come to these shows and they, they come to me and I sign an autograph for them. And then they go and they buy this and they buy that. And they have all these other actors signing. And that said, I don't know how much money they spent going to a convention, but God, I got to give it to them. They, they work hard just like, like anybody else and they and so forth and and they love it and they I guess I guess I make them feel good and I I get along good with the fans and so forth but uh, they're really great people and God bless everyone I love all the fans and uh, I'm on uh, I'm on I have a web page of what do you, I don't I don't have I have a a Facebook. Now my wife takes care of all that. I don't even know how to turn the damn computer on, but she does it for me. Like like this here. You saw when we started, she was setting this thing up. And, yeah, your wife made a cameo year, appearance a few times. Yeah, well, yes, yes, and and uh, and and this what we're doing now is called Zoom, and I I forget the name Zoom, but this is about my fourth one now. Wow, and I'm still. I'm still having problems. As you probably know, I'm, I I talk when I shouldn't talk. And if it makes you feel any better, I'm still trying to figure out the Zoom thing myself. So if we're we're in the same boat together here. So it's kind of funny that the story <laughs> yeah. about you getting into conventions begins with action figures, because I'm actually one of those guys who collects the Star Trek action figures, and there has been a lot of Gorn merchandise. So I'm curious, Bobby, do you collect any of your own Gorn toys? Do you have any Gorn action figures or Gorn statues in your home? Yes, I do. Yeah, I have to admit that. Uh, but I, but I'm still, I'm not a Trekkie. But I, I watch it every night before I go to sleep. I'm on the, uh, this uh, in in California here. I guess it's Station Twenty, and at nighttime I'll watch uh, Matt and Ass Bridges. Now I worked with that with him on on several shows too, and so I watch him and and Cheech, and then after that here comes the Star Trek, and I. I watch them and go to sleep with them on my mind. <laughs> so what do you think about your Gorn action figures? Do you like the way they look? I mean, you had a figure back in the, in the 60s, or rather in the 70s, too, because you were one of the first Mego action figures. I'm, I'm still getting them. Uh, <laughs> I get notified, and they, they say, do you want one? Uh, 
Yeah, salmon. So yes, I have quite a few uh, tall ones, short ones, and I mean, of course, now I've, I've got the little, the little teeny ones uh, that, and I got the bobblehead. Do you have a bobblehead, Gord? I don't have a bobblehead do yet, but I gotta get one. Oh, well, they're they're out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I've got one of those. So yes, I I, I collect them, and I look up there in, in the room. They're the, called the Gorn Room now. And I also have a couple of Gorn heads that, uh, man, I always take one to the to the show with me. And I have one that's kind of old and tattered. Uh, a gentleman in Sweden makes them for me. And uh, I pay him for them, of course. And I have two of them in the Gorn room, two of the heads, a new one and the old one. And uh, I got all that stuff and I keep, thinking you know what am i gonna what am i gonna do with these and you know i guess my wife is gonna be left with them or whatever so but yeah i have them and i like them and and stuff like that but the uh you know the 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 guy who uh who was on the on the on the star trek thing i can't uh, the the russian guy well, uh check out uh, walter canning Chekhov, uh, yeah, Walter. Uh, his house is, is loaded with little things from Star Trek. He's got them going down a wall of his house, yeah. He's quite a fellow, and I, I see him periodically, and he's great. I, I see everybody there and say hi to him, and that that's about it. I mean, I, I don't say, let's go have lunch, or they don't say, let's go have lunch, and so they go to lunch, and I go to lunch. But... Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not a I don't know I'm just I'm just me and what I do is what I do. Well, Bobby, last question for the day because uh, you know I think you kind of already answered this, but what is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe, and what is the best thing? Well, I think the best thing is being a part of being a part of the U of the Star Trek Enterprise. All right, that works for me. Yeah, I mean, I know it sounds like you're one of those guys that everybody loves to meet at conventions. You're obviously a fan favorite. Uh, so, yeah, I really appreciate you spending the time to talk with me today about not just your Star Trek work, but some of your other work and some of your other stunt appearances as well, some of your other acting work. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you today, Bobby. So I thank you so much for your time. And, uh, yeah, again, once the world opens up, I hope I can actually meet you at a con and get my Gorn action figure signed. <laughs> well, anytime. You just you just find me. I'm, I mean, where are you coming from? I'm all the way in New York. In New York. Well, that's a long way. I don't get there anymore. I used to do conventions in New York. So anyway, I want to thank you for this. And I'm sorry I didn't write these names down, but I've, I've, I've got a, a hundred names of, 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 of stuntmen in my, my head that I've worked with and, and stuff like that. And they come and they go. I mean, I, I, I think about them and then they're gone. And then I think about them and I'm going to remember this and then it's gone. And when it gets gone, then I'm sitting here wondering, well, what the hell was his name? And I, mean, I wish I knew more because I could, so I could ask you better questions about it. I was going to ask you about like Yakima Canute, in fact, but I didn't really know if we had time for that. Well, I, I, I know I know who he was. Uh, I worked with his sons, Tap, and, uh, and he has another son. Uh, but... Uh, Yes, I, that that was kind of. I'm just a little behind the Yakima Canut days. Okay. Now he was he was he was he was in the in the era before for myself, and then I came, uh, and uh, oh, I, I've seen a lot of a lot of guys when they when they came into the business and they you know they wanted to learn how to do this and do that and. I say, all right, you know, come, come on, come on up. And there, there's a lot of, of, I don't know if it's now, but it used to be the, there was always a bunch of guys wanting to be stuntmen. And then there's another bunch that want to be stuntmen. They're naming their little groups and stuff like this. You know, that, that's all great. You know, I've had a lot of, lot, lot of, lot of guys come up here. Not a lot, but they come up here and want to do things and they do fights on the lawn and, stuff like that 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 that's you know 
and and they're there some of them are good stuntmen now they're, i don't know uh uh, let's see. I, I know one that uh, is is very very good right now. It's, 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 uh, his name is Dangerous Dennis. D- Dangerous Dennis. Dennis Madalone. Yeah, we talked to him on the show also. Dangerous Dennis. Yeah, he's 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 quite a quite a guy, quite a guy, and a handy man too. And uh, did you ever work with Dennis? Oh no, no. But he came up to my house at one time, I believe. And so the, there's few and and stuff like this. And God bless him. There, the, you know, I guess he's, uh, yeah, he's doing good. I, I I believe I hear that. Yeah, he's doing good. Yeah, again, thank you so much for chatting today. It's been really great to meet the Gorn. Well, I want to appreciate, tell you that I appreciate this whole lot, and I thank you. And so, but thank you very much, and I look forward to, to, to seeing you again someplace. If you come to California and you're doing a convention, and if I'm not on it, call me, and I'll come down and sign some photos for you. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to be on the show. And thank you, fans. Live long and prosper. And that was our chat with Bobby Clark, who I want to thank again for telling us so many stories from that era of Hollywood that I admittedly don't know much about. And then when you consider that we focused in so much on the stunt industry, one that from that era is very much not discussed, it's even more interesting. It's no wonder that Bobby is such a fan favorite at conventions, and if you get the chance to shake his hand at an event, I hope you'll jump on the opportunity. We've talked plenty about the Gorn today, and I'm a big fan, as I mentioned earlier, of the Gorn. Enough that I go out of my way to specifically collect Gorn merchandise. The Gorn was among the first non-bridge crew to get merchandise, starting with Amigo action figure back in 1974. That figure is considered one of the worst in the Amigo series. And the reason being is that it recycled pieces from their lizard figure, based on the Marvel Comics character, the body and hands of a Planet of the Apes figure, and outfit and accessories from their Star Trek Klingon figure. It's a real mess, and worst of all, the toy wasn't even green. That's right, for some unknown reason, Mego made the Gorn brown. Because you all remember that famous scene with the brown Gorn, don't you? What's even more weird about that is that the figure that they used for the head of the lizard was in fact originally a green toy. So it's a very peculiar entry in an otherwise strong line of action figures. Fast forward now to modern times, and the Gorn has had many action figures from Playmates and Diamond Select, as well as two updates on his Mego figure. And in fact, very soon later this year, the Gorn is going to have his very first Funko Pop. And yes, in case you're wondering, I did put my pre-order for it back in March as soon as it was announced. If you're really into the Gorn like I am, you can also find some statues, t-shirts, a Titan vinyl minifigure, latex masks, plush toys, Hallmark tree ornaments, and they've even appeared in comics and video games. And best of all, a fun edible vinyl toy from USAopoly of the Gorn as a cornbread muffin. Yes, he's a Gornbread muffin. It's a terrible pun, and of course, I own it. And if you've got any Gorn merchandise you're willing to part with, you guys know where to hit me up on social media. So that wraps up this week's episode of Trek Untold. Thank you so much for checking it out this week. Please make sure that you're following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at Trek Untold. That's one word, no spaces, at Trek Untold. It's the best way to get updates on guests, check out all the memes and other things that we're posting, and interact with myself and other Star Trek fans. If you'd like to support this podcast, go ahead and check out patreon.com slash trekuntold and become a subscriber to the show. Or check out teespring.com slash stores slash trekuntold to check out some of our merchandise. If you've been enjoying Trek Untold, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel, youtube.com slash nerdnewstoday. Leaving ratings, reviews, and comments are things that all help this podcast grow, and they'll cost you nothing but a few seconds of your time. Doing things like that, or even telling your friends or other Star Trek fans about the stuff you've heard on the show and making sure they know about us are huge helps to keeping Trek Untold growing. Thank you once again to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. Go ahead and check them out at triple-fictionproductions.net. If you'd like to send us some feedback about this episode, suggest a guest, or ask to be booked on the show, go ahead and send me an email at trekuntold at gmail.com. And of course, thanks to listeners like you for choosing Trek Untold and making it your weekly Star Trek podcast. This has been Trek Untold. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and until next time, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.